from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well wherever you are in the world. And today, I would like to continue our discussion of the works that are found in this particular set, which is called Pioneers of African American Cinema. And in particular, I'd like to share with you some thoughts that I have with respect to the short, silent film which is found in this set, this Blu-ray set, which is called Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. According to the materials that are found in this set, the booklet in particular, this film, Mercy the Mummy Mumbled, is a silent film from 1918, approximately 12 minutes as it plays on this particular Blu-ray. And it is credited to, uh, directed by R.G. Phillips, photographed by C.C. Fetty, and produced by Ebony Film Corporation, and also uh, Luther Pollard. And Luther Pollard and his brother Fritz Pollard were two figures in Ebony Film Corporation, and I'll get to that in one moment. But we should keep in mind, for the time being anyway, that this is a short comedy which is produced by Ebony Film Corporation. And I mentioned in the video where I was talking about the film Two Nights of Vaudeville, I mentioned in that video that it was my understanding and it was my suggestion also that uh, we should try to have a certain degree of caution when we watch that film Two Nights of Vaudeville, and I explained the reasons why in that particular video. Another way for me to put that was uh, I thought that it was very important that whenever we watch that film and whenever we discuss that film, it was very important to have as well-informed a perspective on the background of that film as possible. And uh, one of the ways that we can do that is to read and to research about the historical details and background that are relevant with respect to that particular film. And I left a bibliography or suggested reading list under that particular video. Well, the same type of discussion applies whenever we speak about Ebony Film Corporation, and thus the same type of discussion applies whenever we talk about films from Ebony Film Corporation, including this film, Mercy, The Mummy Mumbled. And therefore, I would also, with great respect, I would also suggest that it is very important to be very cautious and to take care whenever we talk about this film. And another way to put that is, I think it is very important that we try our very best with the materials that are available to us wherever we are in the world, that we try our best to try to have a well-informed take and perspective on this and on other films from Ebony Film Corporation, including A Reckless Rover, which is another film which I will speak about in a separate video. And the reason why I think it is important, because we should understand that with these particular films, uh, Two Nights of Vaudeville, of course, being uh, from the historical feature film uh, company, which I spoke about in that video, but it is uh, often discussed in the context of Ebony Film Corporation. Uh, and so whenever we talk about these films, historical feature film, company films, or Ebony Film Corporation films, uh, we have to remember that uh, these are films that uh, have been generally regarded uh, both in critical circles and in academic circles. These have been generally regarded as not necessarily being uh, high 
uh, high levels of cinematic paragons uh, of African American cinema. Uh, in other words, a lot of these films have been regarded uh, in critical and academic circles as uh, oftentimes uh, people have said that they are uh, not necessarily uh, uh, breaking uh, stereotypes, but rather they are reinforcing stereotypes, racial stereotypes, uh, and other similar types of interpretations. And so with that, we must be sure that we understand why these kinds of views are prevalent and why, therefore, uh, there, these films uh, might be included in this set, right? And so uh, we should keep this in mind whenever we talk about these films and whenever we try to approach these films and watch these films and discuss these films. So uh, this is a very key aspect uh, of Ebony Film Corporation discussion and also in particular films like Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. So let us keep this in mind. Uh, specifically, this film is about a young man, a young African-American man, who is essentially trying to woo or try to win over the hand of a young African-American woman, his girlfriend or uh, someone that he is in love with. And she also uh, is uh, very affectionate as well. And so they are in love, apparently and he wants to win her hand in marriage, we assume. Her father is a professor, and the professor is engaged in these experiments uh, that involve some kind of magic potion or something of that sort. And it involves uh, reanimating uh, the inanimate. And that involves, for instance, animating what looks like a, a, a duck, and then also uh, the main component of the film, trying to obtain a mummy, a human-sized mummy, and therefore trying to thus apply the potion on the mummy and seeing what ensues. So uh, this is the situation of the film and comic hijinks ensues with these particular situations. And so it is the young man who tries to uh, get the idea of trying to t uh, do something with the situation because uh, he remembers what the professor said to him. He says, the professor said to the young man, uh, I will consent to your marriage. Uh, that's the assumption. I will consent if my uh, if my uh, discovery is a success. And so therefore the implication being that the young man will be able to win uh, the daughter's hand in marriage if the professor's discovery is successful. And so this gives the young man and the idea to try to uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, make a mummy and what the young man does, he, he hires another person to stand in as a mummy. He gets a large human-sized sarcophagus from a costume store. He gets bandages and he rolls up this other young man and he puts him in there and he arranges it. The young man arranges it such that he has someone sell the, this mummy to the professor and the, uh, he also arranges for the mummy and the sarcophagus, sarcophagus to be delivered to the professor. And uh, comic hijinks ensues along the way in terms of the delivery. And then the professor applies his potion to the, the mummy who is actually a real man. He doesn't, the professor doesn't know that this is not a real mummy, but then he applies this potion with this oversized syringe, and uh, we see a lot of uh, further comic hijinks ensue. Uh, uh, added to this mix, we have two, what are described as two Egyptian emissaries who are uh, trying to find uh, what is described as being the mummy of royal rambunctions that, according to one of the intertitle cards, uh, 
uh, was stolen uh, in the past by American souvenir hunters. And so the implication is that these two Egyptian emissaries are wandering around on the hunt for this particular mummy. They get wind of this mummy and they find this fake mummy. They don't know it's fake, but they find this uh, mummy and they try to steal it, which they do. And once they steal it, then further comic hijinks ensue because they don't realize that the mummy is in fact this other man that is just having bandages wrapped up. And then the man suddenly comes back to life after having all this stuff applied to him, uh, everyone thinking that he's a real mummy, but in fact he is not. And uh, he, the, this uh, potion was applied to him. Uh, his body was essentially kidnapped by these two Egyptian emissaries. And then further comic hijinks ensue and the end of the story occurs. And so this is the story of this comic farce, uh, this another, another example of a physical slapstick comedy. And uh, this is uh, described also in the materials here as being, uh, uh, it still may be appreciated as a clever knockabout comedy. And so uh, this is on, uh, in terms of its, uh, its, what it shows us on screen anyway, and the story that it is trying to tell, it looks like, and it ap operates as, a comedy, a physical comedy, with certain situations that are uh, that lead to more uh, episodes of physical comedy that are stretched uh, over these particular uh, this particular narrative that is once again based on the conceit that uh, this young man uh, hires someone else to essentially dress up as a mummy and see what happens. So this is the essential conceit of the comedy, and uh, I think that. Uh, one, when watching this film uh, and just watching the film on its own, I think one might get the impression, and I think not unreasonably so, that the film itself doesn't necessarily seem to suggest anything that might be uh, espousing or otherwise containing overt racial stereotypes, at least when we watch the film in isolation. And I think that uh, anyone who has this uh, view of this film, I think that is not an unreasonable uh, approach to have, at least when initially, initially approaching this work. And I think we can see this because of uh, the way that the, uh, the, the young man character uh, is trying to uh, essentially develop his plan uh, with respect to hiring someone else to play the mummy, hiring yet another person to uh, sell the mummy, hiring yet other people to deliver the mummy, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we don't necessarily see uh, in that uh, we don't necessarily see in that story, for instance, we don't necessarily see any overly exaggerated uh, title cards that indicate uh, dialect or syntax that would be over exaggerated to the point of being racially uh, stereotypes uh, in terms of uh, the dialect. Uh, and so uh, we don't see any of those types of title cards. We don't see any other intertitle card illustrations that would also uh, be uh, considered to be uh, maybe uh, insulting racial stereotypes. So we don't see anything of that nature. Save that because we will see something similar in a discussion uh, in the film A Reckless Rover. And so uh, let's uh, keep this in mind when we talk about that particular film in an upcoming video. But for purposes of Mercy the Mummy Mumbled, again, the per the intertitle cards that appear in the print that we have here don't have any of these uh, a dialect, dial, a dialect described lines of dialogue. There are no other indications, uh, misspellings, uh, exaggerated syntax, etc. There's nothing like that that I can identify in here. 
and there are no uh, illustrations that could be described of, as being overtly racist racial stereotypes. Uh, and so there is none of that operating, at least on the surface of this. And so uh, it might seem like a, an innocuous type of comedy. Um, there are, of course, the images of the two Egyptian emissaries and these are obviously African-American actors who are dressed up in this, uh, in this uh, Egy Egyptian uh, costume garb, or, or to be more specific, they are dressed up in a costume that is meant to in some way present a kind of exaggerated, stereotypical view of the Egyptian at least in the context of this film. And so we have to wonder, however, is this, uh, can this be considered to be a, a, a stereotype, a racial stereotype that reaches the level of offensive or not? And again, we should leave it up to, uh, you know, I will leave it up to you when you see this film to uh, determine for yourself whether the film and this, this particular depiction, whether this film includes this kind of racial stereotype. I, I should point out that the, the materials here describe this particular aspect of the film as being uh, innocuous. Uh, and another way to put it is uh, it's described here as being the innocuous caricatures of the Egyptians in this film and the Chinese laundrymen in A Reckless Rover suggest uh, Pollard and company abided by the belief that turnabout is fair play. And so uh, we should keep this in mind also because this is actually a potentially troublesome or problematic aspect of the film uh, in terms of uh, the inclusion of some kind of uh, racial-based stereotype in this film. So uh, it is not completely free of, of uh, any kind of racial stereotype, let me put it that way. Uh, but we do have this depiction here, and so we should keep this in mind. But uh, as far as stereotypes of African Americans go in this film, I think the, there might be some issue with respect to how, for example, one of the people that the young man hires to sell the mummy, he immediately... Uh, gets into a fight with the young man in terms of the money, the $1,000. And so uh, for some uh, unknown reason, uh, this man that is hired to sell the mummy suddenly tries to maybe steal the money or, or, not, uh, or try to uh, maybe take all the money without uh, dividing up the share or something like that. And so a fight incurs between the two men, which is a little bit uh, odd. And so I'm not sure if this what this is meant to suggest, but uh, and I, I don't necessarily uh, I'm suggesting I'm not suggesting that this is automatically an overt racial stereotype of any kind. But I do want to say that uh, if we are trying to identify things that might be things that could have some kind of aspect of a problematic nature, let me put it that way, this it could be one of those examples. Again, I will leave it up to you to watch the film and make your own determination. Another similar kind of possibility could be where we have the uh, two uh, carriage drivers, the, the horse and buggy carriage drivers who delivered the mummy in the sarcophagus to the professor's house. Uh, they meet uh, the two Egyptians and the, uh, the carriage drivers say, they don't say Egyptian mummy. Uh, one of them says Egyptian rummy. And so uh, this could be considered possibly, maybe, to be bordering upon a, a, a kind of stereotypical view of the quote-unquote uneducated uh, person here. Uh, but uh, to maybe to uh, counter that, a possibility, uh, one should also realize that at least as far as the print uh, that we have for this film included in the set is concerned, we don't have any, as I say, uh, overly exaggerated syntax dialect that is being employed in the intertitle that is used with this particular line. And so the only change of English would be the word rummy, 
uh, to replace the word mummy. And so with that, my friends, I uh, am trying to suggest to you that at least when we look at the film in isolation, when we see the film in isolation, um, although there might be some areas that could potentially be somewhat problematic to a certain degree anyway, I would suggest that, uh, again, when looking at this film in isolation, it could seem to be a, a very light-hearted, innocuous comedy that has bits of uh, very funny uh, physical humor and certain comic hijinks situations that ensue with regard to this uh, very outlandish story about uh, someone who is pretending to be a mummy, etc. And so this could be seen to be, as I say, a light-hearted, innocuous comedy when uh, taken in isolation. But I do, again, want to uh, very uh, respectfully suggest that uh, when we see this film, we should try our best to not look at this film in isolation, but rather to keep in mind uh, as much of the historical background and details uh, that make up the general context with respect to this film and Ebony Film Corporation in general. And so uh, when we look at that context, it is my suggestion that uh, perhaps this film is uh, more problematic than the film itself, when looked at in isolation, might otherwise suggest. And so because of its potentially problematic uh, state, uh, when looked at as a whole, then uh, it is uh, another question as to why exactly the film was included in the set in the first place. And so, and the same is true for A Reckless Rover as well. Uh, and so what do I mean by this? Okay, so uh, Ebony Film Corporation is the key, and Luther Pollard is the key. And in order to uh, in order to understand what Ebony Film Corporation is, uh, we should look at the materials and uh, scholarly research articles and books uh, that we can. Now, I've tried to prov provide a suggested reading list below in the description box, and so uh, please. Uh, if you can, try to find some of these materials and uh, see what you can figure out and discover with respect to what Ebony Film Corporation was. Based off of what I understand it is, my understanding is that this was a another white-owned film production company that used uh, black actors in their cast to make these films that had uh, African-American uh, cast members in these various films. And there were, quite, there were quite a number of them, actually, that were made uh, starting in 1970, 1918, through, the, uh, through 1919. And so it was rather short-lived, my understanding is, the Ebony Film Corporation, but they did uh, they did have a certain number of films as well, and they showed these films, and they marketed these films, and they publicized these films. And the, uh, as I say, this company was white-owned, which means that uh, the, uh, the, the people that worked at and that owned this company uh, were white. And the people that worked there were white, except for uh, two exceptions. And again, this is according to uh, my understanding of the situation based off of the materials from, for example, Jack, uh, Professor uh, Jacqueline uh, Nijuma Stewart in her book uh, Migrating to the Movies, who, and also um, uh, Gerald Butters, and both of whom cite um, the scholar Henry T. Sampson uh, when they're talking about Ebony Film Corporation. And uh, in other words, this was a white-owned company that had people who were working there who were white, except for two people, Luther Pollard and his brother Fitz, Fritz Pollard. And Luther Pollard, in particular, is the key figure, sometimes also referred to as L.J. Pollard. But Luther Pollard is this figure. Now, Luther Pollard and his brother Fritz Pollard were African-American. 
And Luther Pollard is described as being uh, a, sort of a, a manager, a, a producer, who worked at Ebony Film Corporation. And Luther Pollard is, uh, a, I would I want to suggest to you, uh, considered in uh, academic circles, uh, in particular in the uh, academic discussions that have been uh, participated in by Henry T. Sampson and Gerald Butters and also another uh, scholar called Thomas Cripps. In particular, Samson and Cripps. Uh, he is uh, Luther Pollard is is somewhat of a controversial figure, and there is still a debate in academia as to whether Luther Pollard was a figure that was really uh, actively promoting positive images and uh, positive, non stereotypical. Uh, uh, representations of African Americans in cinema, or whether Luther Pollard was in fact just a front man for this particular company, Ebony Film Corporation, and or uh, Luther Pollard was uh, someone who was a hypocrite when it came to uh, the films at Ebony Film Corporation in that uh, he, Luther Pollard was someone who on the one hand was promoting uh, race pride in the various uh, promotions uh, in the trade newspapers, but at the same time uh, was making films at Ebony Film Corporation that arguably were uh, not uh, breaking racial stereotypes, but rather reinforcing racial stereotypes. And so uh, many scholars have been debating the role of Luther Pollard and exactly wh whether he was a positive force or whether he was uh, uh, a force that was uh, harmful uh, to uh, depictions of African Americans in cinema during this time. And I should say in particular that uh, Professor Stewart in her book uh, makes reference to this and describes how on the one hand uh, scholars like uh, or uh, Henry T. Sampson seems to think that Luther Pollard was a figure that was trying to promote uh, positive uh, African American depictions in cinema, and that uh, Sampson believed that, or Sampson described Luther Pollard as also being someone who's trying to promote or trying to have the films of the Lincoln Motion Picture uh, Company. Uh, distributed uh, to audiences, and that this was a very, uh, this is a very positive thing for African Americans, uh, because as you know, uh, the um, uh, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company is a company that uh, was uh, owned by uh, African Americans, and so uh, Lincoln Motion Picture uh, uh, Company films. Uh, uh, getting distribution was a very big deal, and so uh, scholar Henry T. Sampson describes Luther Pollard as uh, being someone who tried to make efforts to get the Lincoln Motion Picture Company films distributed, uh, and so that is seen, at least by Sampson anyway, to be another reason why that's a positive when des uh, describing Pollard. And also Sampson describes Pollard as being someone who is trying to eliminate or remove to the extent possible, uh, racially insulting intertitle card uh, dialect uh, or use of dialect in intercards, inter uh, the title cards that were used in the silent films. As I say, the over exaggerated, overly exaggerated dialect and syntax use. Um, and according to Samson, Luther Pollard was trying to uh, remove that from the films. And so uh, with these reasons, according to Samson, Luther Pollard could be seen as being a kind of positive force. On the other side of the debate, please note that uh, the scholar Cripps describes Pollard as being someone who, on the one hand, was essentially espousing race pride in trade newspapers, while at the same time essentially reinforcing traditional uh, and thus insulting black racial stereotypes in the films of Ebony Film Corporation. And so this is to say that the figure of Luther Pollard is a somewhat controversial one 
in academic circles. And uh, still, I think people are debating this. Um, I would uh, point out also that we have the perspectives of Professor Stewart in her book. And also we have the perspective of uh, Charles Musser, in a certain degree anyway, in his essay, which is included here, called uh, Race, Cinema, and the Color Line. And for example, Charles Musser uh, describes very briefly Luther Pollard on page eight of the book, uh, the booklet here. And he says, uh, the African-American Pollard was proud of his pictures, which, quote, proved to the public that colored players can put over a good comedy without any of that crap shooting, chicken stealing, razor display, watermelon eating stuff that the colored people generally have been a little disgusted in seeing, end quote. So this is a quote that is taken from a letter, according to the materials here, this is taken from a letter from Luther Pollard to George P. Johnson. And George, this is from uh, dated 1918, uh, or June 12th, 1918. And so, and this is a letter uh, to from Pollard to George P. Johnson. And George P. Johnson, uh, as described by Professor Stewart, is uh, someone from the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, this company that I described as being a company that was owned by African Americans. It was a film production company. And so Luther Pollard is writing this letter to this other person, George P. Johnson. And in this letter, he says this language, which is quoted by uh, Professor Stewart and now also by Professor Musser uh, for purposes of this book. Uh, and so uh, in this language, which is oft cited, uh, the suggestion is that Luther Pollard seems to be expressing this uh, this belief that the films that he was involved in at Ebony Film Corporation, including a film like Mercy the Mummy Mumbled, were films that included African-American casts. They were stories that revolved, to a certain degree anyway, around stories that involved these African-American characters, and that they didn't include these very overt ugly racial stereotypes that could be found in other films that involved African-American depictions in cinema that were being produced by other film uh, companies other than Ebony Film Corporation. And this is a point that Jacqueline uh, uh, Najuma Stewart, Professor Stewart, mentions in her book. This is also a point that is uh, reinforced by uh, scholar Butters. And so he mentions for instance, in some of his writings that indeed some of the other or the other white owned uh, film production companies that existed uh, at the time other than uh, Ebony Film Corporation did in fact have uh, these uh, uglier racial stereotypes of African-Americans that is referred to in this letter from Luther Pollard. And so uh, this is to say, therefore, that uh, perhaps it could be said uh, to a certain degree, that while not necessarily reaching the level of a paragon, a cinematic paragon of depictions of African-American characters or African-American people in cinema, uh, nonetheless, uh, there is the viewpoint in academia that perhaps, relatively speaking, relative to other uh, film production companies that existed at the time, white-owned film production companies that, exist, that existed at the time, perhaps the films of Ebony Film Corporation were like what Luther J. Pollard was describing in that they didn't necessarily include these uh, overt racial stereotypes. And if that's the case, then perhaps films like Mercy the Mummy Mumbled do have a place to a certain degree anyway, in the conversation when it comes to discussing films that are included in pioneers of African-American cinema. And so there is something to be said about that. And uh, again, I point out that professors Stewart and Musser were the ones that curated this set. And so uh, this is uh, very significant. And indeed, going back to the Musser essay here, he goes on and says, Professor Musser says, indeed, as Henry T. Sampson has documented, the major uh, white production companies made many films in which such tropes uh, 
the tropes that were described in the Luther J. Pollard letter. Such tropes were the mainstays of their depictions of African Americans. And Professor Musser cites the Henry T. Sampson text, which is also cited in the description box in my suggested reading list in the description box below. Uh, that uh, work being, excuse me, uh, let's get the title right, that work being uh, Blacks in Black and White, a Source Book in Black Films, uh, second edition. And so uh, this is to say, therefore, that there is the viewpoint in academic circles that Luther J. Pollard's films, uh, the Ebony Film Corporation films themselves, do have a certain place, let's say, in the context of the discussion. Okay. But we also have to remind ourselves that there is the other side of the debate, uh, as expressed by scholars like Cripps, and uh, we should also try to uh, try to figure that out and to try to understand that other side of the debate. In other words, what is the viewpoint or what are the reasons why films of the Ebony Film Corporation are seen to be uh, films that portray uh, or that otherwise uh, uh, suggest uh, negative portrayals of African Americans in cinema? And so we have one side of the debate, but the other side of the debate is that these are negative portrayals. And what are the reasons for this kind of debate? Okay. Well, some of the reasons why the Ebony Film Corporation films are considered by uh, some to be negative portrayals is that uh, uh, some of the reasons include, for example, that we have to remember that the Ebony Film Corporation was a white-owned company and that Luther J. Pollard... Uh, and the Ebony Film Corporation marketed these Ebony Film Corporation films to not just black audiences, but also to white audiences. And therefore, as part of that marketing, white audiences discovered or learned about the films in newspapers that had a, a majority or almost entire readership that were uh, uh, the white population. And so uh, these films were often marketed in these trade newspapers. And part of the marketing, at least according to the scholarship that is included in the description box below, according to the scholarship, it has been described that the marketing, uh, a good portion of the marketing anyway, uh, for these films uh, in trade publications uh, that uh, oftentimes were in publications that, were, that had a large white readership, uh, that these uh, these uh, descriptions of the films, this marketing campaign for the films, essentially, involved dis describing the uh, the stars uh, of or the cast as being uh, peculiar, uh, you know, colored people who uh, could make you laugh. And so the the, the idea is that uh, is that the the films uh, were marketed in a way that could be seen to be really overly objectifying uh, the fact that uh, objectifying the African American cast and making them seem peculiar and that oh they are in a comedy and that sort of thing and also there were other ways in which uh, these films were marketed in terms of the poster art and other artwork that was used that could be described as being uh, racially insensitive or otherwise employing stereotypical views or relying upon stereotypical views of African Americans. And we should point out also that according to the scholarship, uh, Ebony Film uh, Corporation films were very successful, uh, especially among white audiences. Uh, and this uh, one of the reasons or one of the possibilities that's being cited is that uh, that the marketing campaign was such that these films were directed not just towards black audiences, but also towards white audiences. And they were pretty successful, uh, especially among white audiences. And so uh, uh, but this therefore suggests that the Ebony Film Corporation films are inherently by virtue of the fact that they were marketed in this way they are therefore inherently problematic. That's the argument. And that they were therefore further perpetuating and reinforcing uh, the very damaging racial stereotypes because of the way the films were marketed. Um, and then there were other examples, and we will get to those later, where in fact, not only do we have this notion uh, 
of the films being marketed in this way, but also we have to look at the films themselves. Sometimes we might not necessarily see at first glance and for example, for instance, like Mercy the Mummy Mumble, in general anyway, we might not necessarily see at first glance uh, images that uh, seem to be uh, immediately, obviously, uh, racial stereotypes. But there are other examples. For instance, I would suggest uh, A Reckless Rover, which I'll get to in another video, uh, do include uh, uh, situations and depictions that could be... Um, that could be described themselves as being uh, racist, uh, or racial stereotypes being reinforced. And so uh, this is to say, therefore, that uh, it really depends on the film, I think. But on the whole, because these are Ebony Film Corporation films, that therefore in and of itself makes these films uh, p uh, potentially problematic in the discussion of pioneers of African-American cinema. And so that's the debate. That is the debate. Um, are they problematic or are they worth discussion, at least to a certain degree? And I would also uh, just further add as a caveat that even those people who seem to believe that there is a certain uh, degree of room in the discussion for these films, um, I would still suggest that, as I say, I don't think they see these films, and I know that they don't see these films as high-level examples of of great depictions of African Americans in uh, cinema during this time. You know, that's not the case. But the point is that whether they are truly problematic to the point where they shouldn't be included in the conversation at all, or they are still potentially problematic in certain degrees, but also there might be room in a limited way for a kind of discussion uh, with the understanding and knowing what the films are, knowing what the debate is, knowing the potentially problematic aspects of Luther Pollard and Ebony Film Corporation, etc. And so that's the debate, at least as far as I understand it. And so, uh, but I, I do understand the positions of Professor Stewart and also Professor Musser. And uh, they do make some very interesting points. Uh, for instance, Professor Stewart in her scholarship suggests, for exa example, the possibility, for instance, of looking at the Ebony Film Corporation films as maybe not necessarily uh, or not necessarily, as maybe being films. Uh, she seems to suggest the possibility of reading some of the films as uh, being uh, alternate depictions of, of uh, the African-American uh, male uh, sort of entertainer. So she suggests the possibility, perhaps, of, of that possible reading. Again, I'm not sure specifically with respect to Mercy of the Mummy Mumbled, but that is one suggestion. And again, that's my interpretation of what it is she's saying. So maybe I'm not necessarily understanding what she has written correctly but uh, in, my, in my mind, but that's my understanding. In, in other words, this uh, it could be seen as being a, an alternative or updated uh, depiction of this kind of figure in uh, uh, this kind of figure, right? And then another way of looking at this or potential reading of these films, according to Professor Stewart, could be as a kind of, of, of a critique of black modernity, uh, the urban modernity. And thus, uh, another way to describe it is that these depictions are not traditional stereotypes per se, but that they could be seen as being uh, sort of meta uh, uh, critiques on the racial stereotypes. And so, again, when we see the films, we have to determine uh, if we really believe that, if we really think that those readings are possible or not. And again, when we make these decisions in our own heads, and when we view the films in trying to make these decisions, we should be as well informed as possible. And so, uh, let's be as well informed as possible and also let's try to keep this in mind again when we try to uh, uh, f uh, understand these films and try to read them and see whether we agree with certain viewpoints or agree with others okay um, and um, uh, so um, and also Professor Stewart I think makes another point which is that uh, another way of looking at these films, the Ebony Company, uh, Ebony Feature, I'm sorry, Ebony Film Corporation films, including films like Mercy the Mummy Mumble, another way of looking at the films could be that they could be seen to be, in this essence, undercutting the image or the view of the African-American person 
that existed in the North. In other words, uh, remember, we have to remember that Ebony Film Corporation was based in Chicago, which is, of course, in the North. And these were films that were made between circa 1917 to 1919. And uh, the idea that I think uh, Professor Stewart is, uh, is suggesting here is that, uh, well, we have this notion that, uh, that African Americans in the North uh, were in an environment where they were, uh, th there were, uh, uh, it, it was a more open environment in terms of race relations, in terms of more opportunities, work and education opportunities, etc., that were afforded to African Americans who are living in the North. So that was that's the general image, right? Well, uh, Professor Stewart seems to su suggest that if we take the Ebony Film Corporation films uh, as films that are uh, uh, perpetuating the traditional racial stereotype, then perhaps they can be seen in an ironic way to be undercutting this notion of the opportunities afforded to African Americans uh, in the North. In other words, uh, we have these, this notion of the opportunities afforded to African Americans in the population on the one hand, but then the other hand, films that are produced by uh, film companies in Chicago, like Ebony Film Productions or Ebony Film uh, Corporation, uh, are depicting African Americans in a what could be seen to be arguably uh, a stereotypical light. And so, uh, as you can see, the films therefore are undercutting this notion of the opportunities that are afforded in the North. And so, I think that viewpoint is a very interesting one, and uh, as well as the other points that I think Professor Stewart is making, a very interesting, fascinating uh, read. And so that is further uh, that is my further suggestion to check out her work as well as some of her other some of the other works that are listed below. And again, that's a starting point, and hopefully that will lead you to other works of scholarship uh, in the context of Ebony Film Corporation, um, Historical Feature Film Corporate uh, Company, etc., and other companies like this. Uh, if you're interested. Uh, but uh, the point, therefore, I just want to take a step back and say as a general point here is that we have to be careful. We have to be very careful when we are viewing films from Ebony Film Corporation, which includes films like Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. And so when we look, therefore, once again at Mercy the Mummy Mumbled, and we think now about these this debate about Luther Pollard, this debate about Ebony Film Corporation, uh, whether Ebony Film Corporation were making films that were perpetuating the racial stereotypes, or whether there is room to uh, consider them to a certain degree in the context of pioneers of African American cinema. What, what, whatever the case may be, we have to understand that that debate does exist and it still exists. Uh, and so when we look at this film again, we have to keep that in mind. And uh, while it might be said that the film itself is innocuous, again, with uh, certain caveats and certain uh, notes of caution that I tried to suggest earlier in this video, while the film in general might be considered to be an innocuous comedy, we still must keep in mind the history and the controversy that surrounds Ebony Film Corporation and Luther Pollard. And so, uh, that is something that I would uh, actually very strongly urge uh, just more research on, if possible. Uh, and as I say, there are books that are available. I'm sure there are other online resources that can then lead you to further resources and further research. Uh, but we should keep this in mind when we see this film, Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. And uh, when, therefore, if we have that understanding firmly in our grasp, then I think having a film like this included as part of the collection here, I think does hold certain uh, value, uh, at least in terms of the conversation. And I think this is led by Professor Stewart and then also by Professor Musser. And I think they do uh, an admirable, uh, they do an admirable, uh, or they make very admirable efforts in trying to argue or suggest to us the reasons why these films could be considered, to a certain degree anyway, in the context of pioneers of African American cinema, thus giving us reasons why these films, uh, Mercy the Mummy Mumbled and others, are included here. And so I think that is something that is worth considering when we think about the film Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. But once again, I should point out that my interpretation 
uh, my understanding is admittedly very, very shallow. And I am not a scholar and I am not a, an expert when it comes to this. I am only trying to explain what it is I think the situation is based off of my own limited research. And so this is my way also of suggesting and uh, recommending that uh, along with this set, which I say is really great, it has the films itself, it has certain supplements, it has the book, uh, which has essays by both Professor Stewart and also by Professor Musser. Uh, along with this uh, stuff, these materials, uh, try also to find materials uh, at your at the library or maybe bookstores or online uh, based on your the the materials and resources available to you please do your best uh, i encourage you to really uh, try to find uh, materials outside of the set that can uh, really help one to get a further a better understanding of what exactly ebony film corporation was and who Luther Pollard was and what his position is or what his position is regarded to be in the whole context of this conversation. And so uh, that's my uh, strong uh, suggestion is to do your best to find as many of those materials as you can. Now, I've done my best to provide a list. It's a, I admit a short list and it's not exhaustive, but it is a list of works that you can uh, try to find. Uh, one or more of them, and then maybe they can then lead you to other works because they will have their own bibliographies, of course. And so uh, that is hopefully a starting point for you and your own uh, journey and research when it comes to this particular uh, part of the works in Pioneers in African American Cinema. So uh, this is Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. And we should keep this conversation in mind because this conversation will be directly relevant to the film that I will discuss in the next video, which is called A Reckless Rover. And A Reckless Rover is yet another Ebony Film Corporation film. It is another film, therefore, that has the involvement of Luther Pollard. And this will also have uh, certain issues within the text of the film itself, as well as uh, on a broader scale in terms of the F Ebony Film Corporation itself, this will have uh, issues, uh, actually uh, problematic issues, and I would actually suggest w with respect to the text of the film itself, issues that are, uh, that are at least arguably perhaps somewhat more problematic than those that we might have tried to identify in Mercy the Mummy Mumbled. And so we have, therefore, to keep in mind this debate and this conversation about uh, really the role of Ebony Film Corporation and Luther Pollard. And so let us keep this uh, conversation in mind when we go to the next film, A Reckless Rover, and that will be the next video uh, that I will try to uh, upload with respect to our discussions of pioneers of African American cinema. But in the meantime, let's just keep this uh, conversation in mind. And uh, once again, I encourage you, if possible, and to the extent uh, that you are able to, to try to uh, do uh, further research on your own based off of, uh, for example, the books that can be cited or that can be list found in the list in the description box below. Uh, so, my friends, uh, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. And until then, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you once again for your time, my friends, and cheers. Thank you.